Hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, to be able to share some ideas about our digital future. Uh, our digital future, which I think could be a new golden age of opportunity. We are, in fact, at a crucial historical crossroads. We can build a digital and sustainable global golden age, or we can also let the world risk a violent and divided future full of uncertainty for all. Why do I know this? I know this because of history, because I've been studying technological revolutions since the very beginning. I mean, since they began, not, <laughs> not my beginning. And, um, and I think I can tell you a story, tell you how it has been happening, and tell you why this is the moment to take the big decisions. We have had five technological revolutions in the past 240 years. The first was, of course, the Industrial Revolution, mainly in England. Machines, factories, canals. Every revolution has a new infrastructure. A new infrastructure that transforms the markets, that widens the possibilities of, of trading and in all areas, in goods, people mobility, and information. So canals was the first one. Then we come to the age of steam, coal, iron, and railways, where, of course, railways were the big, together with telegraph. Then comes the third, a very important one, because it was the first globalization. It's the age of steel and heavy engineering, electrical, chemical, civil, naval. And it was the time when uh, steam ships, transoceanic telegraph, transcontinental railways converted the whole world into a huge market. And it was a time of great achievements in engineering and great social achievements. Then we come in 1908 to the age of the automobile, oil, plastics and mass production. It's the one we're still trying to get rid of, trying to construct the new one. Because now we are in the middle, and notice that I say in the middle, midway along the diffusion of the age of information technology and telecommunications. We're still having new systems coming online, new systems coming across the economy, of course, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, robotics, all the rest. So in terms of technology, we're still having more and more and more. But it is now a very peculiar moment when Every revolution about midway has transformed the way those technologies are used, has given meaning and direction to the way technologies are used. So each of these revolutions brings a techno-economic and socio-institutional shift with a new paradigm for innovation and profitability. So it's really like a change in direction, not only a change of the means, but also a change in which direction we take those new means, those new tools, those new possibilities. What the historical record reveals is that there is a regular sequence of bubbles and golden ages in the way that these technological revolutions diffuse. So if we, if we put them all in parallel, we note that there is, first of all, that the rise of the new technologies comes with the decline of the previous. Then we have a bubble prosperity, which crashes. We can have one, two or three crashes. I think we're waiting for another one now. So that's, that period is the turning point when you see all the good and the bad things that the bubble prosperity did, or the bubble prosperities. Then we come to a golden age prosperity, and then maturity and gestation of the new, because the new technological revolution comes as a response to the limits of the previous. So we had Canal Mania first, and then with a couple of crashes, the Great British Leap after that. We had Railway Mania, Railway Panic, and then the Victorian boom. We had multiple global booms in the Gilded Age, all especially in the Southern Hemisphere, but also in the US. All the countries that were just coming up, sort of like China and India today, we had the US and Germany just rising, and lots of the Southern Hemisphere countries coming into stream, Argentina, Australia, New Zealand, etc. So after that, after those many crashes, we had the Belle Epoque, 
in Europe and the progressive era in the USA. Then we had the next revolution, we had the Roaring Twenties, the crash of 29, and then the longest up to now turning point, the whole of the 1930s plus the World War. After that, we had the biggest boom in history, the post-war golden age. And now, of course, we have had already our dot-com boom, our global casino, then we had our first crash in 2000, then the second crash in 2008. Maybe we'll have another crash ahead. But after that, we should have the possibility of a sustainable global information technology golden age, if history is like that. So the thing is that we are precisely at that turning point moment. We are precisely at the moment when we have the golden age ahead. This is the turning point, and it's the equivalent of the 1930s. So what is the nature of the turning point? As in the 1930s and now, we have structural unemployment. Even if the numbers say so, we all know that there are lots of people that are out of the labor market and there are several countries that have serious structural unemployment and so on. We have de-skilling, inequality, unbearable on inequality, hopelessness and of course resentment, which is the result of all that de-skilling and all that inequality. On the other hand, we have casino finance. Finance, instead of funding the real economy, just funds itself. It's in this betting game. Giant monopolies, feeble growth, talk of secular stagnation. In fact, the term secular stagnation was said for the first time in the 1930s. Recessions, even depressions in some cases. We have xenophobia. It can be the Jews, or it can be the Muslims, or it can be the Mexicans. It's some, somebody must be guilty of the problem that we're facing, of the skilling and lack of jobs and so on. That's what people feel. We have economic migrations, because of course also the inequality is across the world. Social unrest, political cleavages, populist messianic leaders. We had Hitler, we had Stalin. In the 1930s, we had the two extremes. Now we're having all the two extremes almost in every country because populism feeds in resentment. And resentment is the result of having lost what you had and not being able to replace it with anything. So that's the moment we are living. And the fact that political parties are dividing and all this is part of this phenomenon. But all that is happening with a huge technological potential that lacks a clear and common synergistic direction. A direction that will bring all those forces into a very strong way of having a socially sustainable golden age. It is then the historical moment for business and government to identify and act upon the most socially cohesive paths. In fact, that's what a golden age is. A golden age is a win-win time. It's a time when business is profitable and society is prosperous, when people feel they have a future, and when business has a present that is uh, prosperous and, and profitable and is also going forward. So that combination is what makes a golden age, when it's only some businesses, especially finance, that's growing like crazy and inequality reigns in society. That's the typical early period of every technological revolution, and it's, very, it's a very perilous moment in, in history each time. That means, in fact, that every paradigm shift leads to a realignment of the political spectrum. So what we have is the people looking forward and the people looking backward, both in what we could be called left and right, but I prefer to call the people with collective values and goals, where they think we're all in the same boat, uh, or the people who are actually thinking that everyone to themselves, it's all so individualistic values and goals. But anyway, if we make that simplistic assumption that there is such a division in society, the most important thing is that in both camps, we have those looking backward and those looking forward. So the idea of make America great again is this sort of way of thinking that the good is back there, not forward. So that's the big difference. We've got to look forward. We've got to think of a new way 
of coming to a great society. That means that traditional parties will divide and new movements will emerge as they are in fact emerging, all the Greens and all the, and of course all the populist movements. There is a shift in culture, in values and aspirations. We've been hearing about it just before me, both speakers. So we are talking about something that has happened each time. And that means that success in business or in politics goes to those who best understand and shape the new potential. So you've got to understand what's going on. You've got to understand in which direction you can take it, but also understanding technology thoroughly. You've got to understand the nature of the technology and the difference there is between the old technologies and the last. Just to tell you one very simple thing. We are moving from products to services, and we're turning lots of products into services. The direction, the natural direction of digital technologies is stored intangible. So that, for instance, that huge shift that's happening is one of the most important things to understand. Now, how was the mass production revolution politically shaped? Well, we had Nazi fascism, we had Sino-Soviet socialism, and we had Keynesian social democracies. And they were all using the same mass production technologies, notice. And before that, the revolution before that, the age of steel and heavy engineering, how was it shaped? British free market empire, free market all the time, which by the way made them decline, cartelized and unionized Germany, extremely successful organizing every single group of society into corporations, into unions, into, to defend their, their interests, and protected American Gilded Age. America built huge tariff barriers, 64% average of all their imports, and inside ferocious competition, and they were hugely successful and made an enormous leap forward. Completely different to British, completely different to Germany. Each one did it differently. So technology provides the options, but society chooses the future. Now, what directions were given by the Keynesian social democracies to get the post-war boom? Two directions, suburbanization and the Cold War with very high taxes on the welfare state. Let me tell you that taxes during Eisenhower's uh, power in the 1950s, the top rate of tax in the United States was 92%. This was accepted as a possibility. I'm sure very few people paid it, but it doesn't make any difference. It really was very high taxes. Why? Because you couldn't build a welfare state without proper welfare taxes, but the money went from the people to the government, from, from the rich to the government, from the government to the man, the man to the rich, and the rich to the government. So it was a wonderful cycle of going around, and everybody won along the way. So what innovation opportunities did suburbanization provide? Many. The house, minimum cost, best appearance, the family at home, Comfort and disposability, all the plastics, time saving in food and cleaning, entertainment center, good life for children and for pets, etc. And for pets. Suburbia, the car, appearance and improvements, convenience shops, the malls, services, etc. What about the Cold War? What did it mean in terms of innovation? Well, the space race. Frontier technology in materials, in spaceships, in communication and electronics, which is, of course, what brought what we now have, food and clothing, and the military, missiles, nuclear and conventional weapons, information and communication systems, and so on. So all those possibilities were there for innovation. Very clear, two big directions. And once the directions are clear, supply and demand follow each other. So we had the demand and supply uh, appeared and that created more demand. And social policy created a win-win game. Improving conditions for workers provided peace and growing demand. So you have good jobs, wages, working hours, accident insurance, health coverage, pensions, etc. And it went right around because business was really profitable. Uh, regulation, protecting consumers, made a safe and even playing field. 
no monopolistic abuse, no unfair competition, and with false claims or with health hazards. So the whole thing was also consumer protection, which was also good for business because it was the same for everybody. High taxes provided solvent and reliable demand through direct procurement, public employment, income distribution policies, and so on. And at the same time, government was funding frontier innovation and guaranteed the next revolution. So all those things were converging in synergistic directions favoring both business and society. So in which directions could we now take the ICT revolution? How could we shape it? Two big directions, smart green growth and full global development. Smart green growth, meaning of course environmental plus digital. And full global development because we need demand creation for the advanced world. Precisely, that's one of the best ways to do so, because right now the demand in the advanced world is buying Chinese goods. That's, you know, it's going, consumer goods have gone abroad. So we need also to do all that with intelligent taxation and, and the redesigned welfare state. If we just flipped taxation from profits and uh, salaries, as VAT does, to materials, energy, and transport, we would already make everybody innovate in reducing materials, reducing energy, and reducing transport, and it would change the whole, the whole relative cost structure for almost every business. So we've got to rethink, we have to rethink everything, because the way government was set up, apart from its bureaucratic nature, we just got to change, thanks to information technology, we need to change the whole, the welfare state is obsolete, the whole lot has to be changed just as much as companies have changed, have to change their strategies. So why is a global sustainable golden age possible with the ICT revolution? Why, why do we worry about sustainability and why do we think ICT could help? Well, it's because both dematerialization and globalization are in the nature of the ICT paradigm. It's logical for a digital technology, for an intangible technology, to move towards intangibility. And it's logical for a technology that can move completely across the world timelessly to favor globalization. So those things, and of course that means that if we go to, uh, to full global development, the demand for materials, for, um, for engineering, for equipment, for infrastructure, for high-tech services, for consultancy, for education, for all the things that the advanced world can provide would have growing demand as, as the developing world develops and it would reduce, of course, migrations and all the desperation there and they in turn would then be able to also produce. So basically, it would be a win-win game but not due to technological determinism. It's not because ICT in its nature is like that, that it's going to happen. It's going to happen if it is geared in that direction, if technology, if, if technology policy, if policy in general, if economic policy goes in the direction of both dematerialization and globalization. Because technological revolutions, as I just told you before, always offer many possible directions. We already see China, which is one of the few that's clearly on a path that's successful using all these technologies. So smart green sharing lifestyles can unleash a full employment golden age. We can have an aspirational good life. It's always important that it should be an aspirational life. It's not that We've got to stop using green, we've got to stop using everything because the planet is going to be destroyed, so we stop, so we are sacrificed. No, zero sacrifice. It's better. It's a better life that we have to construct. We've got to move to services because it's better to move to services. Well, we already know that it's better to do a lot of things like streaming music and doing all these things in in our computers, in our mobiles. So we can move many other things in that way and it will be a better life with less energy, less materials, more ICT and more jobs. 
So the human-centered services, healthcare, personalized services, leisure and sports, entertainment, mobility and distribution, diversified electricity, education industry. We need an education industry that covers everything, a huge private education of all sorts. We need to learn all sorts of things. Uh, the arts to practice and to enjoy, logistics, information and networking, sharing and barter, conservation, rental and maintenance. We have to move to a rental economy. We can't continue with possessions, possessions and stop the planned obsolescence. We can print, we can 3D print all parts and we can keep every single product. They can last a hundred years. It's ridiculous that they don't. We have all the technologies to make products last a long time. So, social media, communicating and creating, resource recovery, recycling and reuse, pollution reduction and so on. And on the other hand, modernization of production, the circular economy, truly durable products, 3D printing, the rental model of course, nanotechnology, renewable energy, batteries and carbon capture, sustainable architecture, new construction methods, zero uh, emissions and so on, bioplastics and custom materials, fiber to the home and Wi-Fi infrastructure, smart electrical grid, artificial intelligence and robotics, etc., etc. We go on, hydroponics and so on. Massive innovation and massive employment in sustainable activities with ICT, while also using robotics and AI to maximize wealth creation with very high productivity. We have to stop fearing AI. We have to stop fearing all these technologies. We need robotics, we need AI. We need to use those technologies to create more wealth so that with that wealth we can then create all the services that are low productivity but we can pay them well. That's exactly what happened in the previous revolution. Mass production increased three times, it only increased uh, I mean, manufacturing with mass production, tripled its value during the golden age. It only increased its, employ its employees by 30%. But all the other services that suburb suburban life required, all the banking, the train, you know, the whole thing, the retail, everything, construction, all those things created all the jobs. But those jobs were well paid. And they were well paid because there was high productivity in manufacturing that created the wealth with which to be able to reward and to pay proper taxes and to reward workers properly so that there would be demand precisely in order to create this virtuous cycle. So we need to do the same and we need high productivity at the same time as we create all the other activities. So that, what did we get with the mass production golden age? Employment, education, health and security based on home ownership and mass consumption, but we destroyed the environment and excluded the developing world. What could we get with the digital golden age? We could get all of that, but smart and green, plus Meaning, creativity, social networks, lifelong learning, based on collaboration, access, rental, maintenance, recycling, and reuse. With an improving global society flourishing on a healthy planet. In capitalism, society shapes and is shaped by technology. Understanding and using the potential of ICT for shaping and meaningful, sustainable future is the challenge of this generation. Let's make sure we all face it creatively. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Perez. Um, so we have this wonderful system, as you can see, where people can actually ask questions from the audience. Um, so first question, do we learn from history? And are you optimistic about us <laughs> now learning from history? Well, we sometimes do, we sometimes don't. Santayana said uh, people who don't learn from history are condemned to repeat it. I'm hoping we do repeat it <laughs> because, in fact, it has happened each time. I mean, this is the fifth time. Why, why wouldn't we be able to do? But it's not easy because most people are not really interested in history. They're so much into what's going on and all the problems we're facing. And of course, the thing is that what we're facing is no fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, think of the 1930s. Imagine somebody 
seeing these queues of people, really thin, really emaciated, no jobs, looking, you know, like it was really terrible. And somebody saying, it's okay. Ten years from now, these people are going to have a house, a car at the door, the house full of electrical appliances. They're going to have a lovely job. And was, I can't believe you, you're nuts. That's impossible. Well, it was possible. And it happened for real. Well, now we can think again. And we can stop believing that the present is going to define the future. It's the tools that we have that's going, that are going to define the future. And we've got to use them in a way that will create a golden age that's even better than the last one. Uh -huh. Because this one could be global, not just the advanced world. So w w one more cross question about this universal basic income, resetting capitalism. I What's definitely, your did I that? mention it? I am a big fan of universal basic income. I really think that our current uh, welfare state is completely obsolete. It's as obsolete as records and, uh, and tapes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really not fit for purpose. Today we have, first of all, lots of people uh, working on their own, you know, um, self-employed. We have zero hours contracts. We have Uber and all these other things, the gig economy. Well, what does it mean that you're employed? If you're self-employed, are you employed or unemployed? If you're working for Uber, you're employed or unemployed? So, and then you have to be humiliated. You have to go and prove that you need the money and that you are not working, that you tried and that the horrible job they offered you, you accepted it. And no, give a cushion, give a cushion to everybody, to everybody. And of course, all of us who earn enough will, will return it immediately. All you have to do is increase uh, income tax by a tiny bit and then everybody will pay their money back. You'll only get, so, so just that you give a cushion for insecurity, you give a cushion for young people to study, you give a cushion for women to be able to stay with their babies or maybe to divorce the husband because they have this income for old people to guarantee that. They, and imagine a society, nobody going hungry. That's exactly what this would allow. You, we've got to think what the new situation really is and design a welfare state that makes citizens dignified. We have to dignify every single citizen. No more people sleeping in the street, no more people going hungry, and the reduction in crime, reduction in bureaucracy, reduction in all sorts of things, and you just get your money from the ATM. You know, it's perfect. It can be done very, very easily at a huge savings in the big bureaucratic thing that we now have. Very good. Now, you can see there are many more questions. But yes, we don't have time. We don't have time. But I did finish on exactly Absolutely, on Absolutely, you did fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Pires. Thank okay. you. Okay.